digital making is a lot like the force. It has a light side and a dark side. The light side, of course, being 3D printing, also known as additive manufacturing. Now, at home, we all use FDM style 3D printers, but there's other techniques such as uh, direct metal laser sintering or selective laser sintering for nylon or other plastics. Uh, you have your UV cured resin based systems. You can use welding or I've even seen paper based machines. Uh, so there's all kinds of ways to uh, progressively add material till you have a final shape. The dark side, of course, would be subtractive manufacturing. Uh, most commonly, this is called CNC machining, but just like uh, additive manufacturing, there's a number of techniques. Um, you can use a laser cutter, that's certainly subtractive. Um, also, you could use like electro discharge machining, which is a way that some very precise molds in the plastic industry are made. Um, yeah, so there's two ways to do things, and up until now, on this channel, we've been exclusively a member of the Jedi Council, firmly rooted in the light side of things with 3D printing. But today, we're gonna turn to the dark side a little bit. And we're gonna play with a small CNC machine. So let's get into it. As always with these review videos, I have to thank GearBest.com for sending me the actual unit to test. So this one came in a smaller box than usual, but that's because it doesn't have to be quite as big as a 3D printer. So let's, uh, let's start assembling.
I pretty much finished the assembly last night and in order to, to make this thing, I was just following an image of the product which is listed there on the, on the sales page. And um, there aren't really instructions that I've found in English. Certainly none came in the box and there weren't any on the, uh, on the page. So um, there's a video in Russian and there's a video in Portuguese explaining how to make this. Um, and all three of those sources, the, the image, the product listing image, and the two videos all show the machine being assembled in this orientation. It looks just like this. But this is incorrect, you guys. So if we look here, we can see there's the tip of the bit as it sits in the motor. Um, and what we want to do with that tip is be able to cut all the way back here to the back edge of the table. But the table is currently slid as far forward as it will go. So there's really no way to get that there. Uh, unless we move the whole motor back that distance. And that happens to be the distance of a 2020 extrusion, which is that. So what we need to do here is flip these two brackets uh, around so that the stepper motor and these two linear rails are both on the back side of the gantry. And that will put the motor in the correct position. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's something that's interesting. Now, um, because there are no instructions, I made a couple of mistakes. You might have seen those mistakes being made in the time-lapse video. First of all, these two uh, 2020 extrusions are the long rails. I had them previously mounted right here and right there. Um, I also got these four uh, pieces. I got the top and the bottom mixed up first of all, and then I got these two side pieces flipped, so that I got that completely wrong, but it's, uh, it's in the correct orientation now. So just a few mistakes I made. So let's get the wiring done now. Always, always, always tin your leads. So once you clean the insulation off your wire, you get a little flux on the wire. That helps the solder to flow. Now that that's done, let's get it into the, uh, the little crimp connector here. So this crimp connector is kind of fancy. You want to um, seat it in there like that then get your needle nose pliers. And the first crimp here grabs the actual soldered joint portion. And you can just sort of crimp that down. But the second crimp here is designed to grab the uh, insulation. Now there's a special tool that helps you really get this done right, but I don't have that tool. So I'm assuming you don't either. And that will definitely do the job. So that is super sturdy. And now to be sure of things, we're going to solder the, uh, the connector to the wire right there. Got to make sure some good heat flows in there to get good uh, penetration. There we go. You can see it sweat. You'll see it move all up in there when you, when you get the job done. And this end here gets the, of course it's been tinned and now it just plugs right in. You must tin even the ends that are going into these terminal blocks because you need to get really good uh, bearing on that. And without the tinning, you can get a short or just like not as good of, um, of a connection there. You can see uh, one of my previous videos where I talked about the fire danger in that. Here's our multimeter set to measure continuity. You can see it changes when the two leads touch. So what we want to do here is figure out uh, we have our center post and that is always the hot. That's always the positive in direct current because they try to keep the plug from shorting and so they make the outside the ground. So the positive can't short to anything. So that center plug, we're going we're gonna to search back here. So up on the top there, we've got all of our uh, leads and so we'll test this one right here so i'm touching it there and then let's touch the center post here nothing but if i touch this one down here which is the farthest one down and also the one that's turned at 90 degrees you see the uh, multimeter changes so it's this one here these two are ground okay so here's how you wire this thing uh here i have my 12 volts input and the power from the 12 volts goes that is the positive, goes to this switch and gets broken by the switch. So that way you can turn the, uh, the unit on and off right there by powering the main board. 
the ground goes straight through into the terminal block on the board. Make sure you've got those in the right spot. The negative is down and the positive is on top. The uh, 24 volt input, that would be this one right here, goes uh, power side, goes into this relay, and the out of the relay goes to the motor. The ground goes straight through to the motor. Okay, so you have your X, Y, and Z stepper motors, and those are labeled on the board, so those shouldn't be any problem. Okay, so the last thing to wire in is the, um, the controls for the relay. So this wire right here is labeled S-P-N-E-N. -E so that's spindle and gauge. And so you wanna be on the white, that's the powered side of spindle and gauge. And that goes through, and here on your little, uh, on your little relay board, you can read it underneath there, it says in. So that's your signal in, comes from your spindle and gauge. And then these two wires here are just labeled positive and minus because they need to receive power and we're pulling the power from right there. So we've got the, uh, the blue is power and the yellow is ground. And that's labeled five volts and GND. So pretty, pretty self-explanatory there. And once you've done that, you've got the thing wired, pretty easy. This is the plug that I was using to connect the 12 volt power supply to the board. But no matter what I did, I couldn't get the uh, board to power on. So I did some continuity checking. Starting uh, with the power supply, definitely feeding out 12 volts. So I just plugged into that. Um, and then I checked it at the board, right there where, where it connects on the terminal blocks and there was nothing. So it has to be between the power supply connector and the board. Well, this is the only component in between those two moments. So check this component. Well, when I go to check the uh, the ground here, that's this, uh, this shiny part down here. When I push my, one thing, my one probe onto that, and I push the other probe onto there, we see that it makes continuity. It's pretty good. It's just fine, it pops right up. You see the, uh, the screen reading. However, when I take my plug here and plug it in, and then I go try to go to the ground, nothing. So for some reason, that plug is just not making a connection, uh, which is okay, because this kit came with these connectors. Now I've got three of the female and one of the males. So I just put the male here. So we have a female and then a male. So there's absolutely no chance that I can get this thing wired incorrectly. I will always have 12 volts going to 12 volts and 24 volts going into there. That also allowed me to get rid of those ugly handwritten 12 volt, 24 volt labels. And this is the final assembly on the machine here. Uh, you can see that I can spin the bed all the way to the front and the the bit will fall off the back of the bed which is just what we want the same thing goes if I spin the bed all the way to the back the bit falls off the front of the bed so that is the correct orientation you see how I have this bar sort of laid over on the side that way it doesn't uh, we don't have a collision problem between the stepper motor and the top bar and yeah everything is set up in a good orientation so it will all work and work correctly an important detail to note is these two nuts, which I have used on the end of the linear bearing rods uh, as spacers. Now the 2020 extrusions at the front and the back were not cut to the correct length. So those go inside the frame, which means that the frame is too wide for the linear rails. So I had to add the nuts and they may not be exactly precise, but they do the job because this aluminum plate can flex a little bit to make up for any slight discrepancies between the lengths. This is a 10 mil bolt that came out and we actually only need it to be eight millimeters long. This is a little bit too long. This is the replacement, 30 millimeters long. So 30 minus eight is 22 millimeters. We're gonna take this uh, pen tip here. And we're gonna cut two barrels out of it that are 22 millimeters long. I ended up using the middle holes here for the, uh, the board 
And then I had to make those standoffs that you saw me make, and that's how I installed the, uh, the whole brain box there. And you can see that it's offset just enough from the X carriage that you're not gonna get any collision between the brain box. And the reason I set the brain box up so high up here is just to get it out of the way. So any sort of debris flying off the cutter is not gonna make it all the way and get plugging up my electronics or anything like that. And you can see here I have my 24 volt power input. I can't make a mistake of accidentally plugging 12 volts into 24 volts because my 12 volt plug is a female plug. So I'm never gonna be able to cross wire it. Idiot proof, as I said. And here's my little on off button. Now come to find out all that controls is the, uh, is the, is the brains, is the Arduino. If I turn that off, I was hoping that it would deactivate the relay, but the relay stays on. So turning that off, if your spindle is spinning, it will not turn off your spindle. Um, you gotta unplug that to turn the spindle off in, in an emergency. Um, yeah, so that's a good setup. And now that we have that done, let's plug everything in. 12 volts into 12 volts, 24 volts into 24 volts. The, uh, the USB cable into the back there. And the USB cable is plugged into the machine. So we are ready to go. Now what we need to do is go to the product listing on GearBest and scroll down here to where we see these links. So we are gonna need file two. You can read right down here. File two is the software and driver.zip and file seven is the software for flashing firmware.zip. And let's start off with um, software for flashing the firmware. You'll want to extract this RAR file, that is the xloader.rar, and once you've done that, you're gonna be able to open up the, uh, the actual little program. Now that does not install anything, it just opens up the program. Then you want to click here, and you're gonna see gerbil 9hex and that is actually gerbil.9. Now, you can get up to Gerbil 1.1, which is what you see right above it. I downloaded that from the actual Gerbil um, GitHub page, but I didn't feel like configuring it. It needs every value configured, whereas this Gerbil 0.9 is already configured uh, by the manufacturer. So open that up. Then you wanna select uh, your Uno from the board, because that is an Arduino Uno that's driving the, uh, that's driving the little router here. Select your COM port. In my case, it's the only device that's plugged into a USB, so it's gonna be COM5, and your baud rate is 115.200. Okay, so now you just wanna click Upload. Okay, and that's successfully been uploaded. So the next thing to do is back here in your uh, files that you downloaded, we need the CNC software and driver. Software for CNC machine. Double click on that, and you're gonna to want to uh, extract Gerbil controller. That's what that is right there. So once you've extracted that, you're gonna have the setup.exe, double click on that. And what that's gonna do is install this Gerbil controller program. So I'm now opening that, and this is a great little program for your machine. Um, once again, select COM5. In my case, that's the only COM port. You may have other ports, and you might have to choose through them until you get to COM the one that works. Um, again, the baud rate is 115.200, and then just click on open. So now the machine and my computer are talking to each other, and you can see this little SS right here, that's actually dollar sign, dollar sign. You can type in commands right here, dollar sign, dollar sign, but it automatically runs that dollar sign, dollar sign command uh, when, you, when you open up the program. Down here, dollar sign three equals six, that line is the, basically setting for the directions on your axes, X, Y, and Z. This program, or this, uh, this version of Gerbil is set up for the router, the little CNC router, but for whatever reason, the, um, the X and the Y axis are inverted. So what we need to do is go dollar sign three equals, and we wanna set that to be four, enter. Now if we dollar sign, dollar sign, enter, we'll see that the setting has changed. Um, so it's no longer saying six, it's not gonna say dollar sign three equals four. That will get our X, Y, and Z axes traveling in the correct direction. The CNC machine should now be running just fine. So let's just uh, do a little test here. 
what you want to do is actually use your hands to move the CNC machine to a, a good orientation where it's right in the center of the bed. So there we are, it's floating in space. I'm not gonna collide with anything. So back here to the computer, I can go and set my step size. And 10 is kind of risky. Let's start with one. And then I'm gonna click this button and hopefully that's gonna move to the right in the X axis. Error, undefined feed rate. Oh, I forgot about this. You have to go G zero F 200. Now, just in case you're not aware, the maximum feed rate set for this uh, machine is 200 millimeters per minute or something like that. So that's this setting right here, dollar sign 130, 131 and 132. So that's as fast as we'll be able to move it. So we're setting it to the maximum speed and now I should be able to click this and there it moves. So it's moving just a little bit. Let's move it 10. Pretty cool. Let's move the uh, the Y direction now. And that appears to move the table away from you. The table moves away from you when you click the down arrow here. And the reason for that is that relative to the table, the bit is moving down. So that's actually correct. So there we have it. Uh, let's test the Z. And it works just fine. Maybe this is basic knowledge that everybody knows, but let's just go over how the movement on CNC machines and 3D printers works, just for a second. So this is your grid of points that you learned about in grade school. This would be uh, your X axis and your Y axis. And this is your negative, negative quadrant, because you're in negative Y space and negative X space. This is your, what is this, negative X and positive Y, and this is your positive X and negative Y quadrants. So we are never gonna use any of these quadrants on 3D printing or routers, CNC routers. But we do need our origin, that is the zero, zero. And that stays. The origin is the same as this point right here on the bed. Now back to this. If you're moving away from your origin, that's in that direction, in the Y, you're moving in positive. If you're moving away from the origin in the X, you're also moving in positive motion X. And the opposite's true. If you're moving towards the origin, you're moving in a negative direction. So it's just that easy. And the Z, of course, is the same. If you're moving away from the origin, you're moving in positive, and if you're moving towards the origin, you're moving negative. One final check that I forgot to do is this little button down here, that's spindle on. So I'm gonna click that, but let's take a look at the router when I do it. Turns the spindle on. So everything's working and we're in business. Uh, never mind, we're not in business, not yet. Um, over here on the machine, you can see I have it set up so that uh, the bit is right there at the edge of the board. So I can mark that with a pencil right there where the bit hits. So now let's give it a feed rate so that we can do these jogging commands. And that is capital F zero for feed rate, or I'm sorry, capital G zero for a movement command, feed rate of 200. Now that will set all of our uh, movement commands at a feed rate of 200 unless they are redefined. But you must use the capital letters because lowercase letters are not recognized in G code. So now that the feed rate is defined, we can click this button here five times and we will get the machine to move 50 millimeters or what it thinks is 50 millimeters. So let's do that. One, two, three, four, five. And we can see that it moved this far. If I put my digital caliper on that, just a little more than 15, almost 16 millimeters. Let's call it 16 millimeters. Looking right here, dollar sign 100, X steps per millimeter set at 250. So that's the current setting, but we need it to be changed so that it goes 50 millimeters instead of 16 millimeters. And let's just do the math on that. So there's all these videos with long drawn out explanations for how to compute uh, your inches per millimeter uh, for your CNC or your 3D printer. And they're just ridiculous because it's a whole lot easier than they make it seem. All you have to do is, like we just saw, tell it to go a certain distance and measure the actual distance that it went. 
So in our case, we told it to go 50, 50 millimeters, doesn't matter the unit here, and it actually went 16, okay? And the steps per millimeter were set at 250. So what we need to know is what this value is gonna be. So this is just cross multiplying fractions. 50 times 250 divided by 16 equals 781.25. Okay, that's not a very round number. And also, I'm not very sure of this number. I did not measure it very precisely. So that could be 15.75, could be 15.5. It was something a little bit less than 15. So I'm gonna guess here that that number is actually 800 because there's an even number of steps in the um, inside of the stepper motor. So let's see what happens when we do it the other direction now. So 50 times 250 divided by 800. 15.65, my measurement certainly could have been that. So I'm gonna say that this is most likely our actual value that we need for steps per millimeter. Now here in the command line, so S100 equals 800, enter. So do that for the next two lines, dollar sign 101 equals 800, and dollar sign 102 equals 800. Now dollar sign, dollar sign, and there you have it, the settings have been changed. So now if I go back to here and click this five times, it should move 50 millimeters. Let's try it. One, two, three, four, five. It should actually move the bit 50 millimeters. And look at that, we're right on the money. So let's set up our first file and get cutting. Now we need to download Inkscape. And it's pretty easy to figure out how you do that. So once you've got that, you install it on your computer. The next thing you need to do is download ArtCam free. There's a paid version and there's a free version right there. So you don't have to actually uh, give them any real information. You can just put fake information there and it'll download just fine. Here in Inkscape, I'm gonna to go to File, Document Properties, and I'm gonna set up my width and my height on this document to be 80 millimeters by 80 millimeters. And that is the size of the cuttable area that I want to, uh, to use on the bed. Now you can get a little bit larger, but for this point, we're just, gonna, we're just gonna do it like that. By the way, if you hold the control button down on your keyboard and use your scroll wheel on your mouse, you can zoom in and out in Inkscape. Okay, so clicking over here on the letter A allows us to write text. Let's choose our font. I have a Google font installed called Roboto. And I like that font. It's pretty close to Arial, but it's not Arial. And I'm going to type just like that. Um, then I'm going to scale this so that it fits. And by the way, if you hold the control button down on in Inkscape, as you scale, it holds your proportions. See, if I don't hold control, I can squish it and do all kinds of weird things, which I don't want. So if you hold control, your proportions stay consistent. Now that I've done that, I wanna go over here to my fill and stroke paddle and do a fill of nothing. And then I want to do a stroke of something. Highlight all that again and come up here to path, object to path. Now if I come over here and I select the point editing thing, we can see all these points. So it's no longer text. I can no longer edit it like text. Um, but that's, we can't use text in our next program. So I wanna go file, save as, and I'm gonna save it right onto my desktop as a DXF, that's a drawing exchange format for AutoCAD. Now, we want to close out of Inkscape and open up Autodesk ArtCam Free. We go File, Open. On the desktop, we've got our 
drawing.dxf. And this is all acceptable. We're working in millimeters for this whole project. Don't do inches, it's just gonna be bad. Hold the space bar down and use the left mouse to zoom around. The other way you can do this is by clicking the middle mouse button, like your scroll wheel button on your mouse. And that way you can rotate around to view the, uh, the, what you've created in three dimensions. So let's select everything here. Let's select everything, there we go. And then what we wanna do is make a toolpath out of it. So you see the little T button up there. So we wanna cut on the line. So we don't wanna to cut to the outside or the inside. We wanna cut along the line. And we want our start depth to be zero and our finish depth, I've found that point five is a decent depth. That's just a barely scoring it. Let's go with 0.65 of a millimeter. So it's very small, uh, just enough to sort of score the surface. The next thing we want to do is select our tool. Now, because our tool is a very sharp pointed uh, V-bit, we're just going to select the 0.05 conical flat bit right there. And that works. For our purposes here, cutting direction really doesn't matter, but climb cutting versus conventional cutting can be a pretty big deal. So uh, when you do other operations and get more skilled at CNC machining, uh, that's going to be an issue. But for now, we can just leave it as climb cutting. So we're going to leave all the rest of this pretty much uh, there for those two. But in options, uh, we want our safe. We want to set that. Actually, five millimeters is fine. Now, this is just the distance that it lifts off of the cutting surface. So, you know, we could go smaller and it would cut more quickly because there'd be less Z retraction. But, you know, let's just leave it at five mils just for the heck of it. And here is where we determine our thickness of our stock. And I've measured my stock to be 8.5 millimeters, although, you know, it really doesn't matter because we're barely cutting into the surface. But, uh, you know, why not just good, good hygienic practices here, 8.5 millimeters, and just declare it that. So now it kind of resets us in the, uh, in the view, but you can see our stock now um, is where it's at. So uh, now we just click the calculate button and we can see our tool pads in there. You see the blue lines? Those are the actual file and the red lines are the path of the bit. So I can simulate this by clicking the simulation control button. Yep, and we can go through it step by step with this little button right here and watch it move each time it does a different movement. Or we can just press play and watch it cut the whole thing out. So there we are, we're ready to go. So now right here on the little save icon, click that. And let's just save that to the desktop. Open up Gerbil controller, connect to your Router, there we are. The next thing to do is very similar to a 3D printer. I just put a piece of paper under the bit and start lowering that spindle until uh, I can't move the paper anymore. Well, actually, there you go, there you go. So you see it's just starting to kind of tear the paper. So we know that the bit is touching the wood, which is exactly where we want it. It's important before you begin that you hit this button right here, zero position. This tells the router that the current location of the bit relative to the bed is the zero position. Without pressing this button, the router is gonna go looking for the zero position with end stops. And this kit, as it's currently set up, does not have end stops. So you must press that button before you start to do a job. So right here, choose file on the desktop. And looky, looky, there it is. And you see all those lines? Those are rapid movements. Those are movements in between where it's cutting. So that is looking good. So we are now ready to cut. And all I have to do is hit begin. Here we go.
And there we have it. Pretty cool, huh? You might find in the course of using your router that you get an error alarm lock, just like I have right here. And turning the router off and on doesn't make it go away. Closing down Gerbil controller here does not make that go away. The way to make it go away is to type dollar sign X, and that just clears the error. And there you have it. That is a fantastic little CNC engraver for the money. And this is a fantastic way to really inexpensively uh, get into CNC machining. So the purpose of this video was to show how inexpensively you can start to learn uh, CNC machining. And for that reason, we used Inkscape and ArtCam Free. Now making this video was my first time using both of those programs. I was trained with Mastercam, which is uh, the very professional program for uh, making your toolpaths. Um, and I actually was trained on an Onsrud 5-axis router and got to do some phenomenal projects on that. But I no longer have access to that machine, so I'm in the same boat as everybody else watching this video where this is now my only CNC machine. Now it's not just for fun, it's actually gonna be very useful in an upcoming project where I'm gonna use it to engrave my own circuit board, which is probably the, the best use for the machine in its stock configuration. Uh, you could certainly modify this machine to make it a whole lot stiffer and you could put a much more powerful spindle on it and you could actually do some uh, metal machining. Um, if you have not already seen it, I will put a link in the description down below to the other YouTuber called My Ford Boy, and he has a great little video series where he modified a similar machine to where he could cut metal on it. Um, so there's a possibility that I might do that in future episodes, but for now it's just so that I can engrave circuit boards. Speaking of links in the description down below, you will find a link to the GearBest listing for this machine along with a coupon code so you can get it for the lowest price possible. Now, you need to know that GearBest does not give me any money for making these reviews. They send me a free machine and I make a video. So if you like these videos and you want to support me, please follow the final link to my Patreon page and toss me a buck or two. Okay, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.